the challenge we have with biology is it's always been a discovery science, not a design science. You think about engineering, it's a design. Biology, you discover. Nature knows all the secrets. We know none of them. We're constantly trying to unlock and reveal what's going on. Hey, Carl, how are you? Good, Iram. How about you? We're like in full autumn Halloween mode and the weather seems to be deciding whether it wants to get cold or warm or head straight into winter. But it's exciting. I love Halloween. It's my favorite holiday of the year. I don't usually dress up, but I'm excited to see that. Yeah, yeah. I love autumn. I don't love pumpkin spice, but I do get very excited. Get pumpkins put around the house and just love getting cozy and wearing sweaters and Halloween is one of my favorite holidays. I have costumes for us this year. My son, who is two, he loves this character called Blippi. It's what all the little kids watch. (laughs) Blippi has a hat and glasses, suspenders I bought for him. He doesn't like wearing things. He doesn't like wearing hats and stuff, so he's not wearing it. And then there's another cartoon called Bluey, where there's a family of cartoon dogs. I'll be the mom. My husband will be the dad. And then he will be not Bluey because Bluey's an older kid. There's a younger kid called Bingo, which my son will be. So I'm very excited. As you mentioned, I saw one of your favorite bands, one of my favorite bands. I think a lot of people can understand because of our music on the podcast is a little bit synth wave was Depeche Mode. I mean, Depeche Mode. My goodness. My goodness. Yeah, they've been around forever. They've been around as long as I have. Yeah, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah. like one of my best friends saw their first Los Angeles show on the Sunset Strip down the street from the famous Whiskey at Go-Go. And he saw their first show. I remember him talking about that. Their first ever concert he saw? First show in California or first show oh. in Los Angeles, probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I first saw them when I was in high school. So that was a while ago, over 20 years ago. And it was yeah, their I saw 20- them in college, which was before that. So... <laughs> <laughs> and when I saw them, it was their 25 year anniversary tour. So wow. that was like a while back. But I've seen them a few times since then. They performed at the Barclay Center, which is within walking distance in our neighborhood. So that's really cool to see one of your favorite bands in your neighborhood. Depeche Mode, they're the same, yet they're different. They have unique nuances that they added to their music. Synthwave is having a, its own renaissance. There was like no new wave, but some synths back in the late 70s, early 80s. But it's coming back with some great music out there. I'm sorry, Um, Ram. I have to interrupt you with that comment because I just think that techno rules the world and uh techno drives the music forward. But synthwave is retro, yes, but techno is the future. Yeah, it's like that it's its own genre. Was it with you where there's this map of music? I think we were looking at this big map of all t- music genres. And it was yeah. like 10,000 genres or something like that. And I wonder where techno falls and how close they are. And is it the wave under techno or is there another genre where they all fall under? Yeah, so it's interesting. And I could talk about this a lot since I do listen to a fair amount of music. Not all of it is electronic, but a lot of it is. There is a music genome project that does map out the different genres that way. And you can get a sense of what the genre sounds like. And we have to find this to drop it in the show notes because it is pretty interesting. And I've always looked forward to seeing someone do the same thing for the Tree of Life so that yeah. you could see what the different organisms are, what they have in common, and just being able to click on that. It's something I've thought about. I've been thinking about for a long time because I think it'll make that more accessible to more people to mm-hmm. be able to understand how everything is related genetically on the Tree of Life. Yeah, that would be something. We'll have to dig to see if anyone's working on that and any list listeners know of anyone creating a tree of life specific goes down to every single species of living organisms. That would be awesome to see something like that. That's very interactive and you can drill down and drill up as much as you want. But during the concert, though, I would say that there was an opening act. They were okay. They were actually a Brooklyn based band. And then there was about 20 some minutes between sets and nothing was going on. That's a long time. 20,000 people at the Barclays Center. And I'm like, could something happen here? This is like an educational moment. You have have undivided attention of 20,000 people. And I'm like, where is advertising? Where's the message? And I was like, ah, someone give me a microphone. (laughs) Gave me a little anxiety. I was like, this is a missed opportunity. But there was just two minutes before Depeche Mode came on. They do a lot of charity, which it's so wonderful. The two charities that they're focusing on now is teenage cancer. So teenagers that are dealing with cancer and how to help them and Charity Water. They are a global international brand. Everyone knows Depeche Mode. 
So they really look to these international causes. And I think it's really wonderful what they're doing. They have a call to action. Go to the DepecheMode.com website, which we'll put on our show notes. I think that it was one of the best concerts. David Gahan, the lead singer, he's my spirit animal. So at the concert, everyone's ready to listen to electronic music. They were in the mind space. And when I went to that genetic underground rave at Zimbabwe Beta, there was a lot of visuals of cells moving around and I mean, there wasn't a lot of education there, but there was a lot of thematic, biological, artistic experience. And there were people wearing these really cool black lab coats and they were dancing on stage. There was a performer. I think there's a place for education. There's edutainment, which, okay, I think of Bill Nye, I think of us in a way a little bit. But then there's another level, which I don't know if I've really seen, but it's entrancing, like something where it's psychedelic, you go deep, going to consciousness, almost meditative. And I want to say artistic again, because you can learn that way. You can learn through music. You can learn through different ways of expressing knowledge besides just what we've learned in a classroom. And I feel like through the visuals, through the music, through people, through poetic text, maybe flashing on the screen, there could have been something very memorable, which can then be educational too, if you memorize it. Well, right? I- and it reminds me of those daybreaker events, early morning raves that would end with yoga. And I thought that was going to turn into a trend. There was the Zumba trend there, which continues, maybe not as much. I was under the impression that maybe like 10 years ago, you were going to start to have topics that would be much more fitness focused. And I thought that the daybreaker yoga trend was going to turn into that. But what you're talking about is edutainment raves. Yes. Which yes. I think is an interesting idea. And I really find it interesting too that there was like this 20 minute nothing on stage at Barclays Center. It seems like not just a missed opportunity, but maybe just something else is going on. Because that's a long wait between advanced. Especially when we live in a three second economy. We're always right. like, I went to my phone and I'm like, why am I on my phone? I spent all this money to come here. I have a babysitter. My husband had gone to grab food. So he was like waiting in line. So I was sitting there by myself and I'm like, I'm just going to go into to our Word doc and write notes because I just wanted to talk about this time. Time is so precious and you could do something so magnificent that could have value. I mean, it could have commercial value. You could have had a call to action, maybe do something biological and be like, Ginkgo Biworks. <laughs> you know, right, right. just like have some other company sponsor it. And maybe we talk about all of these companies or we have the founders and CEOs on our podcast that we're making amazing products. So maybe it could be something where it's like, here's the Future Society set and here's C16's like so right. far. <laughs> but something where it's not just sales either. So that's something native to the experience. So you don't get right. like a commercial. And what is that experience? Well, we're in a concert listening to electronic music and take the essence of Depeche Mode and then wrap it up into some type of edutainment experience. My biggest worry with that is that it just ends up becoming another venue for corporate capitalism. Um, well, that whole which, venue is Ticketmaster. Yeah. Well, and I had a different experience because <laughs> I went to MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art with my sister and my niece who were visiting I again got to see that wonderful AI generated Rajfik Anadol. So we got to see that again. But then on the top floor of MoMA, they were doing an Ed Ruscha. I know it's spelled Ruska. I always had it wrong. My wife corrected me. Ed Ruscha retrospective. And he is an artist that came up and became popular doing pop art. And he had a retrospective that kind of showed how his work has evolved over time, which I thought was really interesting. He had some kind of Barbara Kruger type of paintings with big text on them. The two things that stood out for me were these huge canvases of a standard oil station at different angles, very pop art, red and white, yellow and blue on these huge canvases. And then there was one canvas that had a quote from J.G. Ballard, which is one of my favorite authors. So that one immediately stood out for me. But it's a very different experience to go to MoMA and to absorb art quietly as it's Mm -hmm. in front of you. And then downstairs on the third floor, they had an exhibit called Emerging Ecology, which is really about the intersection between architecture and the environment and the start of the environmental movement, which I thought was also very good. So definitely worth checking out if you're in New York City and want to go to MoMA, hit me up. I'm a member and I'm always happy to go. It's nice to go during the week when it's not as crowded. We actually met up with some friends who live in Finland and they asked us if we were going to go to Splash, which is a big startup event that happens in Finland. It may be in November, but it might even be in January. But I'm not planning on going. If someone in the audience is planning on going, let us know. I'm super interested. So let's get into some news before we get into the podcast. 
One of the things that our listeners may not know, but there's been a lot of uncertainty in the biotech industry around funding, but there's still interesting developments that are going on. Ram, you pointed one out to me that Alejandra had pointed out to me like a week before. Tell me why you were excited about it. Yeah, it came across my desk. So the Chan Zuckerberg Institute, Priscilla Chan, Mark Zuckerberg, famous name, I'm sure everyone knows who that person is. They just put $250 million to create a New York bio hub, which would be delivered over 10 years. They actually have two others. There's one in SF and one in Chicago. So they have these bio hubs. And it sounds like a lot of it's going to be for helping with different therapies and different modalities. I know you know a little bit more about what they're focusing on in terms of the technology and the specific biotech that they're going to be researching and funding. I don't know all the details, but the thing that does stand out for me is given that it's Mark Zuckerberg of Meta, formerly known as Facebook, which is a huge digital company, has a huge AI component. What stood out for me in the news when I first read about it was they were going to be focusing on developing digital models of cells, which is something that I think we've probably mentioned over time, but we don't really know what goes on inside a cell. Like the machinery, there's so many events happening simultaneously. If you went on YouTube and you watched a video of DNA being synthesized, you'd be surprised inside a cell how quickly DNA is replicated or translated into proteins. This stuff all happens simultaneously. So a cell, it's a living machine and we still don't have digital models of these living machines. So having a digital powerhouse like Meta apply their AI to cells and to develop these models, I think is going to really be helpful in advancing a lot of fields forward. I know that with the Chan Zuckerberg initiative, those are really focus on healthcare applications. But I think that the kinds of discoveries that come from that will have a big impact on a lot of areas of biotechnology and the ability to grow everything. This ability to model things digitally before you actually create the cells in vivo will save a lot of time and a lot of effort. I'm excited about this. Yeah. And you can also obviously learn about what's going on in the cell and try to get ahead of anything just to model it out and say, okay, this is not going to work. We're not even going to try going down this route. But we actually met a company and I don't know if you can talk about this in too much detail, but it was one of the earlier creators of Oculus before Meta purchased the Oculus. He started another company where they're looking to model the cell. And we have someone yeah. that we know that works there. I wonder if they're working together or are these two things happening separately? Because it'd be so wild to wear a VR headset and the fantastic voyage, which is what Priscilla Chen mentioned, one of the proposals that she received from someone from Yale, the proposal she said read like the fantastic voyage. Could you imagine where wearing like a headset and just seeing what's going on in the cell. You can see it via simulation, but we also have talked to people that are looking to do real-time imaging of cells on the molecular level, which is insane. But could you imagine being able to see what's going on in real time at that level, that microscopic, nanoscopic level? It's just blowing my mind thinking about it. And I could see why people that have built tech companies want to be able to spearhead this because I'm sure there's going to be so much more that comes out of this fundamental research. We need to be able to model not just single cells, but entire organisms if we're going to be engineering them. It's one of the rate limiting steps in biology today is being able to create lots of iterations of cells and to see whether or not a product is being produced and at what rate that product is being produced. Now, imagine that you're trying to create a more complex organism. How much more computing power do you need to be able to model that out before you actually go within the lab? So I'm very excited for this. To me, this is just like another demonstration that despite the kind of uncertainty that has been happening in in biotech, I mean, uncertainty in the economy in general, there is money that continues to be spent and invested. I was going to just highlight a couple of examples of that just so that people know where some money has gone. So in the last couple of weeks, like digital health, unrelated, kind of related or peripherally related to what we talk about and grow everything, Headway, which is a mental health startup, just raised $125 million. Dollars. Our friends at Ginkgo Bioworks signed a deal with Pfizer that's potentially worth $330 million. And that deal is going to focus on RNA discovery. And we know that through the pandemic, the creation of the RNA vaccines against COVID-19 have proven to be very effective and kind of opened up applications for RNA. A crazy deal that I just read about was this deal that Merck signed with the Japanese drug maker Daiichi Sankyo for three drugs that are in the clinical phase. That deal is worth 
worth potentially $22 billion, which is huge, just like an astounding amount of money. And Daiichi yeah. Sankey is going to get almost $5 billion paid up front. That's just one of those deals where you just kind of go, wow, that's a lot of money. Those drugs must be very valuable. What drugs do they find so valuable? These are for antibody drug conjugates, which is something I suspect you're going to be hearing a lot about. What that means is they're basically taking an antibody, which is something that already exists in the human body to help our immune system fight anything that doesn't belong in our body. Antibodies exist. Creating antibodies as medicines is a huge space, but creating conjugates where you take an antibody and you engineer the protein, it's actually would be called a fusion protein, so that the antibody is either more powerful or is more targeted is a huge and growing space. So I could see that being able to do that at scale and having drugs that are already in the clinic is potentially worth $22 billion. (laughs) Well, the the thing is, it's the antibody drug, but the treatment is to help with various solid cancer tumors. So cancer is a very huge issue. Cancer kills, but having a treatment to reduce the damage and for people to go into remission is huge. People pay a lot of money for that or health plans. Yeah. And I'm reading from the article, Merck did this deal to diversify their oncology pipeline. Merck is the makers of the immunotherapy Keytruda, which in the first half of 2023 racked up $12.5 billion in sales. So that just shows how valuable these drugs are and kind of speaks to something we talk about here on Grow Everything that you in biotech, you can create extreme value with very small volumes of product. I wrote about this on Twitter because there's been this ongoing debate in terms of why has it been so hard for non biopharma to be successful? We're seeing successes, but it's slower. And part of it is that when it comes to, say, commodity chemicals or or even in the beauty and personal care space, many of these things have to be priced very competitively and the infrastructure is being built out. People are still building the plane as they fly it. Personal care and beauty is not an urgent, absolute need than a life-saving cancer drug. I'm not going to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for a beauty cream versus a drug that could save my life. Let's do one more deal and then we'll enter the pod. So our friends at ACLID, which is a biosecurity company that's based here in New York, announced that they had signed a seed capital deal. They had an oversubscribed seed funding. And ACLID focuses on developing software that will automate the security aspects of ordering DNA or RNA or genes. What that means is more people are able to produce DNA these days than ever. And desktop DNA synthesizers are becoming readily available. They're going to become very widespread. But with that kind of distributed ability, there is the ability for abuse. People can print dangerous viruses. And there are rules in place. There are regulations for this. And Athlete is one of those companies that's focused on automating that. So congratulations to Kevin, the CEO of Athlete. The last thing I want to mention before we get into the pod is that our friends at Persephone, we had Stephanie Culler here on the podcast a couple months ago. Persephone is focused on the human microbiome. They also announced a deal, which I think we should get into next next time with a big grocery store chain. But they and Ginkgo Bioworks released an anaerobic engineering toolkit. So basically what that means is a toolkit that makes it easier to work with cells that do not live with oxygen, anaerobic cells like those that live in our gut. There's not a lot of oxygen there. I think that kind of toolkit will make it easier for a lot of people to engineer or work with the microbiome of different animals. Speaking of other animals, so this is the perfect transition into our podcast. There is a lot of work that happens in animal health and a lot of work in human health that translates to animal health or animal health translates to human health. What a lot of people don't realize is that animals are great models. I know there's a lot of issues, potential ethical issues with using animals as models for medicines. I think a lot of that stuff has been worked out, but it is something to always be aware of. Animal health is a neglected opportunity. Just think about how many of us have pets, how much we spend on our pets. Think of all the livestock that is grown for food, chicken, pigs, and cows. And then there's horses. People keep horses for pleasure. All of these animals need to be kept healthy. These are all mammals. We humans are mammals. So animal health is one of those areas that requires significant investment and it doesn't get enough investment. So today we're going to be talking to Aaron Schacht of Biome Edit, which is a microbiome company 
need is focused on animals, microbiomes, again, of chickens, pigs, cows. And I'm excited to have Aaron talk. I think Aaron will talk about this lack of investment in animal health, what the opportunities are for crossing over from animal health to human health. He'll give us an update on what is going on with his company. So with that, unless you have something else, Ron, let's get the interview started. Do it. All right, Aaron Schacht, welcome to the Grow Everything podcast. Iram and I are super excited to have you here today. Thank you. Really excited to be here. Why don't we kick it off? And before we get into Biome Edit and what you're doing there, could you give us some insight into how you ended up in the life sciences industry and how you became an entrepreneur? Sure. Great. I've been in the life sciences industry for about 33 years now. So when I graduated from University of Illinois with a degree in organic chemistry, I joined the life sciences industry at Eli Lilly and Company here in Indianapolis, where I've lived since then. And I was a discovery research chemist. And so I got to learn about what it means to try to make a molecule that could become a drug in an industry at a major company that had plenty to offer. It's very interesting. I thought I'd be in industry for a couple of years. I really came to get a job so I could pay off my school debt and thought I'd go back to get a PhD or a medical degree or an MBA. I knew I thought I might do education beyond just a bachelor's degree. But what I learned at Lilly is there were so many opportunities to just follow what was interesting to me within the company. And that's essentially what I did. So for the next 25 years at Lilly, I worked at various different parts of R&D in Lilly, learning all aspects of it. For a decade, I led R&D strategy and portfolio management. So it was all around what does it take to make bets and win in life sciences is what I learned and practiced. And then I moved into an area that was focused on external innovation and thinking about how do you bring ideas from outside in. And I learned about venture funded companies and small companies in that way. And then really my career at Lilly culminated with the opportunity to move to Alanco Animal Health. Alanco was still a division of Lilly at the time, focusing on the animal health aspect of pharmaceuticals. And I was brought over to lead R&D there. I was part of the team that took the company public, separated it from Lilly, stood it up on its own as a standalone company. And I led R&D and business development and regulatory affairs for six years from 2015 to 2021. Throughout the course of my career, I just accumulated this understanding and appreciation for what it takes to innovate novel products in life science. In animal health, there was really a dearth of what I thought was going to be venture capital investing, entrepreneurial-based companies. And so I knew that it was time to enter that next chapter of my career. I wanted to do something entrepreneurial in animal health, just because the opportunity to apply technology, life science, biotechnology, and animal health was really underrepresented over time. And it was ripe for an opportunity for someone like me with that experience to become an entrepreneur. Thank you so much for sharing that. I too come from the world of pharma. So I understand, although I was more in the lab, I wasn't necessarily on the business side of things, but thank you so much for sharing your story. It does seem like you do have the perfect experience to have started Biome Edit, which is a company that focuses on animal health innovation through the microbiome, which we love talking about here at Grow Everything, but you also leverage synthetic biology. So first, what drives you to focus on animal health? But based on your experience, yes, but what is that passion that keeps you going because you're an entrepreneur. Things are hard. But what is it? What's your drive? Yeah, I think the observation that I made is there's really a convergence between the opportunity that biotechnology can have and the need in animal health. And there are fundamental problems in animal health that if you think about it, they're older technologies that are the standards. So antibiotics for use in pathogen control, which we know has with it challenges. Livestock production is an economic game. How do we get the economics of livestock production better? Can we get better products through the use of biotechnology than what they're used to using? And that way they have better tools to control performance and health of livestock. On the pet side, we've seen this dramatic increase in pet ownership. We've seen the technologies that are established really focus on keeping the animal alive, not dying an early death due to an infection or a parasite. So animals are living longer like humans are living longer. They're actually moving indoors from outdoors. So they're living more of a lifestyle that looks like humans. So the opportunity to address and deal with chronic disease is now present and in front of us. I look at the animal health technology base and recognize that it's something like 20 to 30 years behind the leading edge of technology applications in human health. And it just seems like there's a perfect opportunity to provide some sort of translational application. But at the same time, when it comes to the microbiome, I think we're at the early days of really understanding things. And this is where animal health becomes very interesting because we can study the microbiome in the gut of a chicken or a pig or a cow where the genetics are very consistent and the food they eat is very consistent. 
consistent. So all of the variability you might observe is largely attributable to the microbiome. If you compare that to human medicine, human diets are variable, genetics are variable, lifestyles are variable. And as we understand, the microbiota in humans is highly variable as well. So it's harder to make those connections about what's important. So really, animal health becomes a learning laboratory for those applications in the microbiome that I hope yield novel insights that actually can leverage and advance what's going on in the human side as well. I'm super glad you said that, Aaron, because first of all, I think it's interesting that you say that animal health is 20 or 30 years behind human health. But I always think that if you're innovating on the animal health side, the applications to human health should be relatively close. And you could use the examples for, I don't know, moving drugs into the clinic. Is that actually the case or am I mistaken in thinking that way? Yeah, I think what's happened relative, because the human medicine enterprise is such a massive enterprise, both the stakes are really high, as well as the rewards for entrepreneurs are really high. And the regulatory system has adapted to optimize what it means to develop a human drug. And we use animal models as a way of de-risking the technology or the safety of the technology, as opposed to natural animal diseases. Realistically, when you go study something in a dog on the human side, you're not really positioning that product as an opportunity to treat a dog disease because you're not using the dog for anything other than a model of a human disease. I do think there is an opportunity for, as we think about, let's go after a dog dog disease that translates well to a human disease, you could get information about both. I think historically what we've seen is a lot of repurposing from the human side into animal health. The neat thing about that is you start with a lot of, let's say, safety data in a dog. So therefore, you know the product's going to be safe in a dog. Now can we demonstrate efficacy? And even the regulatory apparatus, let's just say here in the U.S., the CEDAR and CBER, which are the human divisions versus CBM, which is the animal health division, there's not a lot of crosstalk between them. So it's up to the industry players to figure out how to translate translate and make those translations and present that in the context of advancing a product. Aaron mentioned CEDAR, CBER, and CVM. These are all departments of the FDA. CEDAR, or C-D-E-R, stands for the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. This department ensures the safety and effectiveness of medications, both prescription and over-the-counter. Their scope extends beyond just medicine. They also regulate products like fluoride and toothpaste and sunscreens. CBER, on the other hand, is a Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. They are tasked with overseeing biological products, such as vaccines and gene therapies, CBER makes sure that these are safe, effective, and available for public use. They also provide information to help people use these products safely. CVM is a center for veterinary medicine. They ensure that animal medications are safe and effective while also guaranteeing that food from treated animals like meat and milk is safe for human consumption. Their work also extends to monitoring animal food safety and educating the public on animal health. But I do think we're entering an era where de-risking proofs of concept for a drug hitting a target can be done in animals on the way to an animal health drug and can open up the possibility of a better starting point on the human health side. And I think we'll see more of that. It'd be ideal if for every time we tested an animal, we were doing it for a reason other than just de-risking a human application. It'd be good if we were finding and creating some benefit for an animal downstream from that as well. And right now you're mainly focusing on the microbiome and you're leveraging synthetic biology. Could you explain some of the core principles and the technologies that drive your company's work? Yeah, our whole platform approach actually began life in Alanco. When I was leading R&D in Alanco, and we took a strategic position that said we were going to innovate alternatives to antibiotics. That's where things really started. Alanco is a big company when it comes to selling antibiotics as feed ingredients and even injectable antibiotics. We wanted to address the issue of antimicrobial resistance and provide the applications of technology that could replace antibiotics as needed. If we think about where antibiotics come from, they're often secondary metabolites from some microorganism. We find it in the ground, we test it in an agri-plate, it inhibits some organism, and all of a sudden we say, what's that chemical and how do we make that chemical at scale and then use it as an antibiotic? So the biological activity of the antibiotic is resident within the microbiome. That's the first observation we made. So we really need to study the microbiome to learn more about how those organisms produce these metabolites and how they have a positive effect and how do they avoid the concern around resistance because it's really when you produce chemicals at scale and expose large populations to them that you worry about resistance. 
So somehow, if you operate within sort of the biological milieu, you might be able to avoid that. So we started with an effort to go create reference libraries of samples that we would collect from animals at various different stages, healthy state, diseased or dysbiotic state, treated state, and return to health, and observe what's the ecophysiology, what's the microbial signature that we can observe across those states, and does it point us in the direction of microorganisms that are important. That led us to then leverage that approach to coming up with microbial consortia that could be feed ingredients that could basically help the animal perform better, maintain a healthy state, resist pathogens better. Sometimes we might identify a molecule that one of those organisms make that plays some functional role in gut health, like an enzyme that degrades some factor that causes inflammation, and we can make a product like that. But ultimately, we made an observation that says these microorganisms that we're discovering in the guts of these animals, they're there for a reason. They play some functional role. They have a beneficial impact, and we could engineer them to do something else too. Really, that's where the future of the company is focused, and that is engineering bacteria to not only play this probiotic support role, but then have some molecule that has some sort of effect or efficacy that we are targeting. Maybe it's an antibody that neutralizes toxins from a pathogen. Maybe it's a therapeutic molecule that plays some role in metabolism. So our idea is that becomes a little bit of a design studio relative to how we can think about engineering products now based on bacterial delivery. Wow, that's a lot to unpack. But I think one of the interesting things that it makes me think about is there is this, I'll say trend, or it's very widespread. Like you said, there's a lot of antibiotics given to animals in their feed, which is unsustainable. It causes a lot of problems. It could also cause a lot of issues for humans. And you guys are addressing that unmet need in a sustainable and environmentally responsible way. But based on the sustainability goals, what kind of impacts do you think what you guys are doing will have on the animal? agriculture industry? I think we think about three different areas where we think our technology can have an impact in agriculture addressing sustainability concerns. I started first with antibiotics. So if we can engineer biological products that actually don't necessarily try to kill a pathogen, but in essence, ameliorate the disease causing effects of a pathogen, we think that's a practical approach to reducing the concern around AMR. And we can prevent disease that way, as opposed to try to treat it or control it through chemicals, which we know potentially lead to resistance and can accumulate in the environment, which can cause other challenges. Aaron mentioned AMR. AMR stands for antimicrobial resistance, and it's the ability of microorganisms like bacteria, viruses, and fungi to resist the effects of antimicrobial drugs that were once effective against them. This resistance can make infections harder to treat, leading to increased medical costs, prolonged hospital stays, and a higher risk of death. AMR is a growing public health concern as it limits the effectiveness of many treatments, potentially turning once manageable infections into life-threatening conditions. The second space, and we have a program in our pipeline focused on this, is food safety. There are pathogens that are concerns for being in the food. So we're very familiar with salmonella, for example, and how meat can be tainted with salmonella and can make the consumer of that meat a human sick. There's another organism called Campylobacter, which is equally challenging, but there aren't good solutions for. So we're targeting a non-antibiotic solution to Campylobacter to address a food safety concern. The third is methane emission reduction. We know the science is teaching us that if you take three components of what happens in the rumen, the feed, the genetics of the cow, and the microbiome, and look at them, microbiome probably has the greatest contribution to what happens in methane emission. And it's because there are microorganisms called methanogens present, and they do a really good job of taking the hydrogen that gets produced in fermentation and converting it into methane. We believe that we can tackle that through modulating the microbiome and or engineering bacteria to express molecules that inhibit methanogen activity. We look at those three fields in livestock production, AMR reduction, food safety risk reduction, and methane emission reduction as actually the focus areas for us, the opportunity for us to not only create great products that help livestock producers do their job, but actually uh, address the attendant risk associated with animal agriculture. Well, yeah, it's definitely something that's necessary. Ultimately, it sounds like creating a gas X for cows, so they don't necessarily <laughs> e express that gas. Right. But that's very interesting. But it sounds like so complex. I mean, we had Stephanie Collar of Persephone Bioscience on here talking about the human microbiome. And one of the things she had mentioned is a documentary called The Invisible Extinction, where there's a lot of microbes that are missing, not like in a human microbiome, but also the animal microbiome. And as you talked about animals moving indoors, have you noticed in your studies that a lot of animals are missing key bacteria and is reintroducing them a solution to help with their diseases or anything that's affecting them? 
I think the idea of getting the function of the microbiome right is the way to think about it. There are different kinds of organisms that can play the same role. So we look at it more, and I think we're at the early stages of learning what that's all about. But if you can create a microbiome functionality, if you have the right consortia of bugs that play these complementary roles to support, in essence, what the host needs to accomplish, we're dependent on these microbes. We cannot live with a sterile gut, for example. I don't think that's a sustainable. We've co-evolved with these bugs, and so they play certain roles for us, and we play certain roles for them. It's a symbiosis. So I think the way I look at, and I understand the concern around certain bugs disappear, the question I would ask is, have other bugs appear that play that role. And we just haven't figured that out yet. So I think the microbiome is a little more resilient than that. At the same time, the basic concept of let's have enough of the right functionality present to maintain the right homeostasis for a healthy gut. That's a concept we want to get right, but there may be many paths to doing that. The diversity we see across people who have similar health states says that you can actually be healthy in different ways when it comes to how you enumerate what's in the microbiome. So I think the key is we're going to learn more over time about how to relate not just composition of microbiome, but function of what's present in the microbiome to health. I'm wondering, Aaron, if you could elaborate on some of the challenges you guys have encountered as you drive innovation in the animal health space using the microbiome. Yeah, great question. So I think as a drug developer, I also have this experience that you're going to have a study that reads out and you're going to have an effect size with a p-value and it's going to be a clear picture of a drug effect. For bacterial-based or microbiome-based solutions, it's not that simple. It's not that easy. A lot of times you could actually overfeed a bacteria and you could stress the animal and you could lose an effect, the positive effect of what they're doing. Because in essence, if you have too much bacteria present, the immune system's got to respond. So this idea that you can superdose these things I think is going to get rationalized. There are some companies out there that think just giving billions and billions of colony forming units of a good microbe is the way to go. But I also think there's a practical limit. Biology has limits. That's the one thing we know is the dynamical system and there are limits and you discover them by testing. So I think there's a lot of variability inherent in studying things like animal performance or gut health. One of the challenges we have is how to design studies in a way that we actually pick up that signal and minimize the noise and operate in a zone where the effects can be observed in a meaningful way that allows you to then go register a product with certain claims or establish a safety profile that's acceptable for a product that maybe doesn't have claims and is generally recognized as a safe product. It's just working in what is a highly variable study space, even though earlier I said there's some variability that's reduced based on how animal agriculture, for example, is accomplished. So it's really just making sense of what is a biological effect in a setting where there's lots of different actors. Yeah, thanks for that. One of the things that we were reading about when we were understanding your company was the idea of microbial atlases and how are they used to develop your products and how does it set your company apart in the animal health field? As I indicated earlier, we were sort of born inside a Lanco, and one of the things mm. we set about to do was to build, in essence, a knowledge base that could become a discovery resource. And so we termed the coin microbial atlas. The neat thing about working at a large animal health company is you're always running studies in animals. I challenged my team to ask the question, is it worthwhile in any study we run to collect, in essence, either fecal samples or intestinal content samples? Now, on the livestock side, in almost every case, it made sense to collect samples because, in essence, you were looking for the relationship between a microbiome and the animal's performance, for example, or disease response. So we set about really a very dedicated journey of getting as many samples as we could across many species as we could across many study settings as we could. And each study that yielded samples became its own unique atlas so to speak. Well, what did we do with the samples? We would isolate the bacteria that were present, culture them, and then analyze them. And we built a high throughput culturomics platform that allowed us to do this, where we could take single organisms, grow them up under certain conditions, and then analyze them for what is the genome sequence, what is the metabolome, what is the transcriptome, and start to collect the data set that says this is the biology of that microbe in that context. So that's the microbial atlas, if you think about it. And then we could look at all of the microbes present in that context as well and ask questions about metagenome activity in that setting. What we built is to date a library of over 10,000 samples coming from 7,500 animals with various layers of that data analysis, that omic analysis as well, followed by the data analysis that we could. And it allows us to actually start with this massive database and then down select for microbes that we think might be important. You said 7,500 animals, but what chickens, cows, horses, what are they? Yeah, chickens, pigs, cows, fish, salmon, cats and dogs. So no horses? 
No horses. No wild animals? Well, we never run studies on wild animals. Mm -hmm. We could go get samples like that and start to explore. And that's an interesting thing. They obviously get into probably a different concept of the role of the microbiome because these are not in production settings. They're just naturally living. And you might actually pick up cues about what a real healthy microbiome is for someone that forages in natural food sources compared to somebody Mm -hmm. who is part of a feed production system where the diet is very well controlled and the environment's curated in a serious way. So yeah, that's an area of opportunity that we don't have any experience with, but could be an interesting source of diversity. One more thing about that, because we talked to Ben Novak of Revive and Restore, and one of the stats we keep coming back to is that of all the mammals on Earth, it's 64% humans, 34% livestock, and just 4% wild mammals. So there is a lot of biodiversity and reintroduction and cloning endangered species, but understanding their microbiome would be very fascinating. And as an entrepreneur, you need to stay focused, but the area of opportunity is there. The academic environment picks that up and we can pick up some cues from them. That's probably the place where that makes the most sense to create knowledge. Our job is to take that knowledge and create products out of it. Yeah, it's interesting because the first time you mentioned performance a couple of minutes ago, I understand performance across livestock, but my mind went to racehorses. And yeah, I started sure. thinking, huh, what does microbiome enhancing bacteria look like to increase the performance of a racehorse or a race dog? But clearly you're not doing that. But you basically have three kinds of products, probiotics, bioactive compounds, and engineered microbial medicines. Could right. you provide examples of what those look like in the real world or maybe a scenario where someone out in the field would want to use those? That's question number one. And then question number two, how are they on the market? How far are you from being on the market if they're not? That's great. I'll use Biometa pipeline examples for each. A probiotic consortia is what we all come to know in humans when you go and buy a line or culturel. That's just a collection of microorganisms that somebody has done some science around and says, these things play a certain role. And if you have more of them, if you have a relative abundance higher of each of these species, you'll have a healthier gut or it'll contribute to something that you want to maintain a health condition around. What we've done is we've taken, for example, our atlas in chickens and pigs, and we've said, let's go identify in healthy chickens and both naturally healthy, but those who have been treated with something and have returned to health, the microorganisms that are present in those chickens. But let's limit it to the field of bacillus strains. Why bacillus strains? One, there's a lot of manufacturing capacity at scale that you can access. Two, bacillus are natural spore formers. And what is a spore forming bacteria? Why is that relevant in animal health? Well, they're naturally heat resistant. They can endure conditions. And when you think about creating an animal feed ingredient, very often animal feed is formulated as a pellet that gets extruded under heated conditions. And therefore, if we can create a product that can actually survive in the feed pelleting process, it'll be one that's readily adopted by the animal production industry. So we said, let's target bacillus for the qualities of a bacillus species. We also know that they are the bacteria that protect against other pathogens, and they potentially provide, let's call it metabolites that improve gut integrity. So we looked at all of our bacillus species that we had curated in our library, over a thousand of them, 1100 of them, and we started down selecting for other criteria. No antimicrobial resistance genes, no toxin genes, any of the bad things that you don't want in one of these bugs. And we got down to a handful of a dozen or so. We started looking at combinations of those dozen, and we ended up selecting a combination of three, two that originated from chicken, one that originated from pig. And then we've been studying that product combination in poultry production setting and swine production setting, addressing the concern around pathogen protection and gut health. That's one of our first products, and that product should launch in the U.S. here early next year, assuming everything goes according to plan. And it'll launch in a partnership that we signed with Nutreco, which is a major feed additive company that liked the idea of this technology being part of their repertoire for what they offer livestock producers. That's a probiotic consortia product. If you look at a bioactive metabolite, for example, years ago, we discovered an enzyme that microbes produce that is an alkaline phosphatase enzyme that breaks down something called LPS. LPS is lipopolysaccharide. It makes up the cell wall of gram-negative pathogens, which are typically the pathogens that cause disease. And very often, an animal can suffer, let's say, a subclinical infection of a gram-negative pathogen, and it won't really suffer disease. But the residue of that bug being present remains in the gut of the animal, and that's an inflammatory ingredient. When we feed this enzyme, we break that ingredient down, reduce gut inflammation, restore gut health, and the animal feeds better. So that's the second product of ours that'll be a feed ingredient. In terms of an engineered bacteria, our leading product in the pipeline in this category is through our atlas analysis, we discovered a couple of microbes that are well adapted to the poultry gut lactobacillus species. 
and we've engineered them to express single chain antibodies against toxin caused by a pathogen, Clostridium perfringens, which causes a disease called necrotic enteritis, which is both a mortality causing as well as performance hindering disease if it outbreaks in a poultry production setting. So here we are, in essence, we actually identified these toxins. We injected them into llamas. The llamas create single chain antibodies as a function of their immune system. We screen the antibodies for their effect to bind and neutralize these toxins. And then we take and create a gene of that sequence of that antibody and put it into a bacteria that then expresses that antibody constitutively. And then we feed that bacteria to a chicken. So they have this antibody factory in their gut functioning from day one. Therefore, if you think about immune response, there's always a lag and it always requires energy to create your own antibodies. Well, we install a little factory that creates antibodies and then the, the bird doesn't have to spend its time with an immune response and using energy. All their energy is devoted to growth and we control the disease through this bacteria that is a living medicine, basically, in neutralizing these toxins from this pathogen. I have two quick questions. Number one, why llamas? And then two, I'm curious what the regulatory pathway looks like for these products. Yeah. So why llamas and any camelid species, the way in which their immune system functions is their immune system produces single chain antibodies. And why is single chain antibody important in engineering bacteria? Think about a human antibody. It's multiple different proteins that get expressed on separate genes that then form an antibody. We don't think we can engineer a bacteria to do all of that orchestration the way a human cell can, but it's really good at expressing a single protein. And so we wanted a protein that folds into an antibody that's just a single chain that allows us to configure a simple gene to install. So llamas are a good source of single chain antibodies, and we want single chain antibodies given our approach. From a regulatory standpoint, these will be live biological therapeutics. In our case, this first product I'm speaking of will go through the USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, where they regulate biologic products that have some impact on immune function of the animal. When we approached the USDA with our technology and said, are you the right body to regulate this? They said, yes. They're typically regulating things like antibodies bodies or vaccines. This isn't sort of neither nor, but has the essence of both. So it's actually a new category of products for the USDA. They don't quite have a name for it yet. And we're the first one in front of them with a product like this. So you guys are doing development. You've got products that are close to being on the market. But what's been the response from the growers or the people in the livestock industry? Our first two products, the Enzyme and the Bacillus Consortium, those look like products they're used to and understanding. I think what we brought is probably a little higher quality science than maybe the garden variety of those products that has been there. There, there are feed enzymes that play a certain role, and they're often used to break down nutrients and to make the food more digestible. We're dealing with an inflammatory condition, so we've got to pivot them into a conversation that says, no, we're improving the health of the gut directly. I think to the extent that you can give them the data that says, hey, I can get an ROI on the use of this product in my production system, they're very enthusiastic. And, and they get more excited about the science when the economics are right. What does that look like? Well, these products have to basically give them like a 3X ROI. For every penny they spend on a feed ingredient, they need an improvement that says it's worth three times that in the production of the livestock. So as long as you're dealing with them on that basis, I think it's a very facile discussion and they are willing to experiment and adopt. And with products that are grass, you can move into production settings like that or you can simulate those in the clinical side and then generate that data and get them excited about it. For a product that's regulated by a USDA or an FDA, you can't get into a production setting at the same scale or in a real world type experience unless you have some sort of authorization from them to do so. We don't have that for these products. So in essence, we have to lead with the scientific story and then share the data associated with how this product does to reduce mortality or reduce lesions, for example, in the chicken's gut, and then get them excited about drawing those conclusions about how this is going to help them. Actually, more chickens make it into the food chain. For every egg I hatch, if I can reduce mortality by 50%, let's say I've got 20% more mortality in my flock, and now I only have 10%, that's more chickens I can sell. So ultimately, it does come back to something like a productivity benefit that has an economic impact for them in their bottom line. Now, if you move into therapeutics on the pet side, it's a very different story. Nobody's eating cats and dogs, or at least not routinely where we sell these products. So now you're dealing with disease claims and helping a pet owner feel like they've done all they could to address the health concern of their pet. 
We've been talking about livestock quite regularly on this podcast, but in the context of cultivated meats and how that industry is trying to become an industry, I guess. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, because there's actually not enough money being poured into that space compared to the livestock agriculture of today, because they receive billions and billions of subsidies. So ideally, they do have the money to pay you. But my question is actually, ideally, this is, will be saving the lives and saving money from a lot of the livestock farms. And we have talked to, I don't know if you know, Vishal of Anika Biosciences, but they have an insurance model that they've wrapped around protecting a lot of their crops using a microbe, using bacillus to tag food. And mm -hmm. so they can have a DNA readout if there is any food recall. Two questions here is, what is your business model and have you explored insurance models? Because it seems like it'd be a good opportunity. Yeah, it's a great question. Our business model is ultimately we're a product innovator. Ideally, if you think about the ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem in animal health, it's not as mature as you have on the human side. We have some big players who can't innovate enough products fast enough to grow at the rates that they like to. And we have a lot of technology that can be applied. So my vision, my dream is that we actually grow an ecosystem of life science innovation, biotechnology innovation in animal health that can actually create a robust venture capital return environment. It's important to note there's not a single fund that exists that is dedicated for investing in animal health. Every fund wow. that invests in animal health only invests in human biotech or ag tech of some other kind. Or now we're seeing a lot more impact funds start to look at animal health. But nobody exists for the purpose of investing in innovation in animal health. So if I'm very successful and make some money on Biomedit, I'll go launch the first fund to do this because I think there's just an uncontested opportunity. I think your okay. question around how do you create and capture value around the use of these products outside of the product itself? And that's what an insurance thing does. The way we're thinking about that is, and methane, I think, allows us to think about this in more concrete ways because there is the emergence of this field around carbon markets where, right. in essence, if I can demonstrate that I reduced carbon output in my business, can I monetize that reduction to somebody who wants to meet a goal of reducing carbon impact for their business, but doesn't have the means of reducing it any other way than buying a carbon credit. So one of the things we'll be exploring in our methane emission reduction program is how do we bring alongside the basic understanding what would be the potential for the carbon reduction credit that the use of our product would generate. And we're skating to a puck. That market isn't viable and vital yet, but it probably becomes viable and vital over the time of the development program. We'll look at that. So that's good. That's a neat starting point. And we're encouraged Amazing. to do that. Yeah. If you then say, OK, well, I've got these two other problems I'm working on food safety and AMR, well, what if I get credits for those as well? And is there a way to tokenize those and monetize those tokens? So we'll be looking at that aspect, not quite the same as insurance, but a different twist on how do you monetize the impact value of your product as opposed to just the economic value of your product? And how do you think about that at the earliest stages of development of that product? That's something we'll take on. Yeah, it would seem like Europe would be a little bit more interested in the carbon markets because they are leading the way there. I don't really know much about what's happening in the U.S. I don't know if U.S. livestock agriculture is even considering participating in that. Yeah, there's a fair bit of evidence, Iram, for interest here. So companies like Tyson and the others, I think they have ESG goals. And part of what they have to yeah. figure out is how do they meet their ESG goals? And this is something they could do right within their own industry setting. I think the best story around carbon credits is you got carbon, the carbon industry industry, coal, oil, et cetera, they're never going to be carbon neutral, but they could be great right. consumers of carbon credits produced in other industries. So I do think there will be a marketplace for this where at the aggregate, we can reduce the footprint, but the way in which that gets credited or monetized is part of an emerging field that we don't know anything about. But I do think there's a lot of interest in the US. The way we're thinking about, we want to do this as an and, not an or. So think about methane. I want to take the hydrogen that builds up in a rumen because of fermentation and that methanogens typically take on and then convert to methane. And I want to redirect that hydrogen to short chain fatty acid production that ends up in protein. So I can reduce methane at the same time as building up meat or milk production and do it in a healthy, sustainable way, get a carbon reduction, but get a meat increase or a milk increase all in a safe and sustainable and biologically relevant way. Yeah, so that is amazing. I mean, that was mind blowing. That's what I love about the conversations we have with people. We never would have thought that you could use biotech to create a insurance product, but also the way you're approaching it, I think is fascinating. Now, I know that you're also a member of various biotech organization boards. And how do you balance what you do at Biomedit with that and the other entrepreneurs that you're working with? 
Yeah, it's been a great honor and privilege to be on the board of a couple of small animal health companies at various different stages, as well as some, what I would say, our industry enabling organizations. Agrinovis Indiana is focused on the ag bioscience economy in Indiana. And I've been involved in that for, it'll be close to a decade now. I've played the top leadership role in the executive board there for a couple of years. And it's all about recognizing the assets the state of Indiana has and growing that economy as best we can. Another institution here in Indiana, Indiana Biosciences Research Institute, is really an organization that sprung up trying to bridge the what is often a divide between academia and industry. And doing so with institutions in Indiana, we've got Eli Lilly Company, major pharmaceutical company, Roche Diagnostics, Cook Biopharma. So there are some big institutions that are completely focused on bio bioscience and some great academic institutions like Purdue and Notre Dame and IU, where there's just not enough crosstalk and collaboration and what I would call entrepreneurial activity between them. And that's what IBRI is focused on. So I think if you integrate across my outside board experiences, I'm all about helping, in essence, this entrepreneurial ecosystem grow in ways where we can observe what's limiting that growth. At the company level, it's all around a strategy for realizing the full potential of the technology that they have through partnership or exit or whatever. And for these institutions I support, it's all about connecting, making the connections that reinforce the function of the ecosystem and give people confidence that starting a company, let's say in Indiana, might be a good idea. We'll learn a lot about how to manage a board. I mean, I've taken the lessons from being on board as to how I think about as a CEO. I think one of the main jobs of a CEO is to manage your stakeholders. And the board is the primary mechanism for doing that. Board function is really critical for a company's success. And so that allows me to have good ideas. I see best practice and I see some worst practice and I navigate effectively, hopefully, between them. Yeah, yeah. You can definitely do knowledge sharing across all these companies to make them more efficient. Your position to really lead this whole industry and your approach is just very admirable. Being able to come from industry, start a company and help these other companies rise up along with you, which is an amazing, amazing feat. And so congratulations to you. Well, thanks a lot. It's a great chapter of my career to be in. Excellent. Excellent. But as CEO, this is your bread and butter. This is what's putting food on your table right now. I'm sure you have other financial things going on. But what is the future of Biomed? We talked about livestock. Of course, that's where the money's coming from, right? That's where the big bucks are. You're talking about pet health too. What's the broader landscape for animal health and welfare? What's the future for Biomed? Yeah, for Biomed, obviously, we want to demonstrate that the platform can yield valuable product in a way. And then through either partnering arrangements or an exit, someone buys us, says we need that platform as part of us or going on and figuring out how to make this company that sustains. Maybe we commercialize our own product. We're in that phase where I'll begin in earnest raising our next round of capital. And we're actually debating exactly how to position the company because we have different alternatives like that. And the market condition is teaching us something about what has worked and not worked over the last couple of years, because I think good fundraising outcomes have been a little more scarce in 22 and 23 than they were in 19 and 20 and 21. So I'm taking all of that in and trying to best position the company. I think if you ask me the question, let's say you're successful to raise the Series B, what would be the exit strategy coming out of the Series B? Because of the fact that we've partnered the first two products that really are reasonably good products, but focused in a niche like livestock feed additives, the real value of the company is going to be in the engineered bacteria platform. We won't have commercial footprint at scale at that point. So the best thing to exit would be to sell this to somebody else and let them finish what we started. Use the platform to continually innovate inside a large corporation, but then be able to commercialize the products, hopefully to a really good outcome. But if you said to me, you're going to raise money beyond that, well, then I would think about the prospects of becoming our own commercial entity and seeing how great a company we can establish in this space. I think about the future of animal health. Obviously, the mission of animal health is very noble in the sense that putting food on the table and preserving the health of these precious companions we have, cats and dogs. But I think about animal health more as a way to learn about how to affect other challenges on the planet or in the human condition. I think about the microbiome and the role it might play in helping us understand what healthy aging looks like. I'd love to see Biomed at some point enter into exploring how does modulation of the microbiome impact aging and how do we use animals to learn that because animals age faster than humans to unlock secrets that might be translatable to human health in that regard. That's sort of pie in the sky further out there, but I do think the potential of what we're learning can be extrapolated to that someday. Wow. And what do you think the future of biotech is in the next three, five, 10 years? 
Yeah, I think we're in a renaissance and I think we're in the post-genomic period. And actually, if we can catch the understanding of the microbiome up to the understanding we have of the genome and the integration of those two, I think it really unlocked a lot. Then you incorporate what we're learning around artificial intelligence, particularly generative AI and the ability to actually design biology on a screen before you ever run a wet lab experiment. I just think the rate at which we learn and can come up with solutions is going to increase significantly in the next decade. That points back to, that's why I think something like aging is now addressable with the convergence of genomics, a microbiome, and AI machine learning. It is the frontier that, frankly, I think all of us that are getting up there and start to think about, we have fewer le- years left on this planet than we've already lived. You personally start to think about, how do I stay vital longer? How do I protect a loved one from an untimely death? How do I help the human condition maximize the application of the wisdom that gets accumulated over time? but the body slows down and therefore that person can't be as active. I just think about all the unlocked potential of very wise people now having a much more healthy sort of golden years and be able to contribute. So I just think you multiply all those effects. I just think we're in a period where we can sit here today and stress over all the challenges and problems in society and our planet, but I look at all the potential to address them now and I'm encouraged and excited. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the use of AI because you are collecting so much data, Mm -hmm. not only across different animals, but all of their microbiomes. And I assume that you're using it. Is that kind of core to the platform? We have a computational team that I think is really amazing in what they're able to do and what they're able to teach us on a couple of levels. One is modeling a complex ecosystem like a microbiome is not easy to do. So we have expertise in that. How do you translate this structure function relationship? If I've got a microbiota that consists of all these organisms in all these relative abundances, how do I understand exactly what that means? The second thing is we design biomolecules to engineer into bacteria. How do we best design them? Let's say I take one of these llama produced antibodies, but I want to tweak it for some reason. How do I use generative AI to come up with a novel structure? What's very interesting is we see a lot of engineering on the human side for proteins where things like unnatural amino acids are introduced as a means of either stabilizing the protein or creating an attachment point for some long chain fatty acid to make it longer acting. Well, we can't do that in bacteria. So how do we design using the natural amino acid template novel structures that have interesting properties? And we're using generative AI to do protein design that way. How do we engineer the bug so that it produces more and expresses more? Which protein or transcription factors could we optimize using AI so that we get a higher expression level or a better growth. So a lot of different opportunities. And this connects to our relationship with Ginkgo Bioworks as well. They've got a large code base. As you know, they're moving into how to teach AI DNA. We expect a lot to come from that. But at the same time, we're doing interesting and clever things ourselves. So there's an interesting place for us to learn together in that regard. Wow. Oh, my God. I have so many questions now, but I know we're at the hour. It's so fascinating. And I love talking about the microbiome. And we have been talking about it in the context of humans. Now that we got your perspective on animals, I think we'll need to bring a soil microbiome person and yeah. what's going on yeah, in our yeah. environment. Aaron, we covered a lot in this hour. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you think we should have? Gosh, no, I think your point about the different kingdoms and how they converge. So animal kingdom, bacterial kingdom, we're really integrating our understanding of the biological basis of life in a way that we haven't before. And I think that's really exciting to be focused on very discrete targets and go after products like that. I'm just in awe of the era we're entering where that's now going to be possible. And I think it opens up so many different possibilities. The challenge we have with biology is it's always been a discovery science, not a design science. If you think about engineering, it's a design. Biology, you discover. Nature knows all the secrets. We know none of them. We're constantly trying to unlock and reveal what's going on. We're getting closer and better. AI is going to be a big contributor to doing that. But I think we just need probably ultimately industry strategies for integrating that knowledge as well. Not just what works, but also what doesn't work so that we make the most efficient use of this explosion of knowledge. Again, what you guys do with your podcast really helps see the essence of all of the things that could come together to create, in essence, where we're headed with biology. But it's exciting. And this is a chemist talking, by the way. So it's an exciting time to be an innovator and an entrepreneur in life science. We're in a renaissance and we don't quite fully understand exactly the order of magnitude, but we ranged in everything from aging to planet health, to food production, to fixing a dog's you know, upset belly in one conversation here. And it's pretty exciting. It is very exciting. Well, thank you so much today, Aaron, for coming on Grow Everything and for having this conversation with us. We'd love to track your progress and have you come on again sometime in the future. 
Great. I'd love to. And thanks for your interest in the area and the opportunity to be with you both. Exciting time to be here. Thank you so much. All right. So, Iram, what did you think of that interview? I loved it. It's so fascinating to me to learn more about the microbiome in general, whether they are in animals or humans or in the soil. Microbes are all around this earth and they're doing fascinating things. And for Aaron to have a company where they just focus on animal microbiome and see what insights they gather, what tools that they're creating. He mentioned the platform and how the microbiome influences not only the health of these animals, but one of the things that I really, really, really wanted to ask him, but we were at time, we were over time, is I wonder how how the microbiome influences the flavor of the animal. So if there are certain microbes in the gut of a cow, does it influence the flavor of it versus those cows that don't have those microbes in their gut? How does the microbiome of Wagyu differ from the microbiome of a Holstein cow? So it's very interesting to pull that thread from a biome, just to pull that thread through and to be able to understand how it influences a lot of different types of parameter, taste, texture, besides the health, growth, there's a lot there. And next time we talk to Aaron, whether it's on this pod or when we talk to him at another time, that's the first question I'm going to ask him. I think that's fascinating because I didn't really think that much about the taste parameter because, I mean, that is why 70% of the animals on the planet are grown as livestock. Taste is very important. Unfortunately, I probably have said it on the pod before, when you taste chicken, generally it doesn't have much of a flavor and we're just growing it as a protein. And a lot of that is affected by what they're feeding those chickens. But as I said in the intro, what I found fascinating was Aaron's take on the fact that this kind of research into the microbiome of animals and just agricultural research in general, the funding is very small. And we've been doing a deep dive in the cultivated meat space. It's one of those areas that despite how important food is, it just doesn't get the kind of funding that it should. The government doesn't really fund it yet. Most of the government funding in agriculture goes to subsidies. We talked about this with Paul Shapiro. The subsidies are going to legacy livestock, agriculture, soybeans, corn, cows, pigs, but not really to the cutting edge research that we need. And they're just going to become increasingly important as we move into a world very seriously affected by climate change. So it's an area for research. We recently published a little bit on LinkedIn just saying this is an area where we need more money. And so I think it's a place that's ripe for investment. And then the other question that you got into too, Iram, is how could the tools that are being developed for these animals be used for human microbiome research? And I think that's something we need to talk to Aaron a bit more about. And it's something we can talk to Stephanie Color about because these tools are very important. And the microbiome is incredibly complex. You're talking about thousands of different organisms that live in our gut. They interact with each other. They are helping digest food. And it's a very complicated space that really the research is very new. It's probably less than 20 years old. Yeah. And then there's another company that came out of the Merck Digital Sciences Studio. They went through the cohort this year and they're looking at how the microbiome affects drug interactions because you're ingesting a drug. It's not automatically absorbing everywhere. It's going to have interactions with the microbes in your gut first. And then what does that do? How does it transform that drug? Does it lose its efficacy? Does it enhance it? And I thought that was a very cool company to be able to look at that. I feel bad that the name is escaping me. But I will find out the name and I'll put it in the show notes. But maybe we should do like a microbiome episode where we have a panel discussion. And wouldn't it be cool if some type of discovery or collaboration just came out of that conversation? I I loved when Aaron was saying that he loves talking to people like us because we're looking at things on a higher level across multiple different industries. We ask questions that they don't get a chance to really think about because they're really focused on delivering on a product to their customer. They don't have this big research and develop an arm, they are just really focused. So we come in and ask these bizarre questions that make them think about new ideas or think of products in a different way. Having Aaron, having Stephanie of Persephone and some of these other new companies that are focusing on the microbiome. Oh, and of course, our friends from Cultivarium. We had Neely on the podcast talking about domesticating different microbes and using them for many different applications, but you have to create that fundamental research. So yes, some government funds would be great.
great because venture capital funding is a bit trickier when you're thinking of deep research, because how do you commercialize that very quickly when a lot of research needs a lot of time and doesn't necessarily have an application at the end because you don't want to necessarily do that because you might not see all of the outcomes of that research. If you're just trying to gun for one product versus trying to create a platform, that's why Cultivarium is so cool because the founders are amazing. Okay. But um, also because <laughs> they're funded in a very different way. They're a focused research organization and they're only mandate is to uncover research, create a platform for domesticating microbes. Making it easier to work with non-model organisms. What people don't realize is that funding research drives technology and technology drives the economy. So the United States after World War II had been spending up to 5% of its GDP investing in basic research. Now it's about 1%. And there are people who are constantly trying to cut that funding down to zero and to eliminate it altogether without realizing the things that we take for granted, things like the internet and computer chips and many medicines, they all have their base in basic research. So we need basic research. It is a driver of the economy. And for what it's worth, the Chinese borrowed that model from the United States and they do invest 5% of their GDP in basic research. So there's a lot to be said for investing in basic research. I'm a big believer in it and I think we need more of it. And then how do you translate that into businesses? That's a different story that we can get into all the time. So Iram, is there anything else you want to add? Because otherwise I'm going to say that's the pod. No, that is a pod. Don't forget to check out the show notes for all of the augmented information that we talk about. Also, please send us a question. We have our Grow Everything hotline. We've been getting some interesting questions and thoughts and specific questions that goes to our guests. We love that. So if you have any questions or comments, please give us a shout out. And if you like what we're doing and want to contribute, want to have a voice, something that you want to bring up on our podcast, please check out our Patreon page. For those that want to be VIPs of the Grow Everything podcast, that's our opportunity to do so. We really, really, really would appreciate your support and your participation in the conversation to grow everything. All right. That's the pod. Talk to you later. 